Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Youngman, and I look forward to making uh, uh, our team is very much looking forward to explaining and telling you about the, a new service that we provided here over the last uh, six months called License and Royalty Compliance. Uh, a quick thing on the agenda, I'll provide an overview about our firm for those who have not um, don't know that much about us. And then basically Ed Soriano will be taking you through the licensing compliance program. Audrey will be taking through the trademark audits part of the program. And then both uh, Ed and Audrey and Doug Slyke will be providing customer examples because we think that's the most best aspect to kind of relate to you and, and give you examples. So and see how it, it relates to your current situation. And then I'll come back on and talk about you assessing your situation and how we could potentially start a dialogue with you and help you out in any way that we can. And then we'll have questions at the end. So now I'll provide just a quick overview on, on, on I Bailey. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, basically uh, uh, our team here, uh, what we put together is specifically for this service. And basically myself, I, I didn't want us to, I didn't want me to be a part of the picture because I'm by far the best looking one of the group. So, um, but I, I, apparently they put me on there. So um, Eric Pulse is in our charge of risk advisory services, heads up the entire group and he heads up this service. Audrey is a senior manager in the risk advisory services and mainly kind of would be the point person for all if you were decide to do the license uh, and do a license or royalty uh, audit and also in putting up, setting up the compliance program. Doug is a manager in the, in the service and actually has done a lot of experience. I've known and worked with Doug for well over 10, 10 years and he would be more on the execution side of the audits. And then Ed Soriano is a senior manager in our risk advisory service and kind of the key to our service. Known Ed a long time, I worked together with him when he's in charge of, the, uh, of these services at both IGT and GE. Um, so very happy to have him on board. And, and so we have an amazing team and each of them will kind of provide a little bit more background as they start their part of the, uh, the presentation. At a glance, um, we are a top CPA firm in the nation. Uh, don't tell anybody, I think we're 17. And we're basically on the west, west of the Mississippi, but we have clients throughout the nation. And as you can see, we have offices in 15 states, over 330 partners, and over 2,500 in staff. So um, very powerful firm. We're over 100 years old. And uh, most of you know who we are. So very proud um, of who we are and what we represent and how we, uh, and how we help assist our clients uh, throughout the nation. So why us? Um, the biggest thing, um, I have a lot of experience myself. Um, my background is big, big eight to, to age myself, but worked with Ed and have been responsible for two consulting practices of which we did these audits. So that's how I met Ed Soriano. But one of the things that over through, through my career that I've seen is if you're going to decide to get an, a third party, somebody do an audit, right, versus yourself, especially in a licensee program, it's really important that if you can use a third party that's independent or perceived to be independent by the licensee. And so therefore it really creates a lot of synergy and a lot less hassle. So for us, this is one of the main reasons that we've been added add value um, in this area. We also have a lot of uh, expertise. Um, I think 50% of our board members are former big four, um, uh, several people on our team are ex big four. So we just said, you know, it's just from, a, from, a, from an experience perspective, from the industry perspective, we're very strong and can help you out depending on which area you're in. And obviously we recognize there's a complete mix of groups here, right? We have, we have um, governments, we have school districts, um, you know, we have universities, um, and then we have obviously companies so, um, that have intellectual property. So I think we're very strong in, in most of the industries and, um, and to be able to help you. The other thing too, is we really are from a dedicated personalized service perspective, you know, the team that you're seeing right now, we have multiple, um, um, Eric will explain how large his team is, but the key performance is you get that key performance and that unique experience and with the group that's on this call um, to really make sure that you understand um, how we can add value to you. And then we wouldn't just go away. We keep you included throughout the entire process. And with that, I will turn it over to Eric. 
Hey, thanks, Matt. Uh, again, my name is Eric Pulse, the principal in charge of Ide Bailey's Risk Advisory Services practice. And uh, within that practice, uh, we do a, a number of things. And one of those things is license and royalty compliance. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, myself for about 10 seconds, I've been here at Ide Bailey for about 10 years uh, prior to coming to Ide Bailey. Um, I spent about 17 years uh, at a large national firm um, doing a, a lot of uh, risk and control sort of work. So I've been doing this sort of thing for going on 30 years, which really depresses me to say that out loud. Um, anyway, let's talk a little bit about, um, about Ide Bailey and, and the, the services that we provide here uh, uh, within, this, or, uh, within uh, our firm. So as you can see by the slide here, our service mix, you know, we've got you know, our traditional audit and tax firm, uh, but about 23% of our revenues come from salt consulting and, and, uh, and other services, uh, which are risk advisory services and license and royalty compliance is, is, uh, is one. Uh, uh, from an industry standpoint, I mean, we, we've got tremendous breadth and depth of services and, and skill sets in a number of industries, as you can see there, uh, our, our firms really our firm's largest industries uh, that we deal with, the financial institutions and government and healthcare, uh, but we're rapidly growing in many of those other industry sectors um, and, and see lots of opportunities there. Uh, and the, the service specialties uh, uh, from a consulting perspective at our firm, um, you can see there, I've, we've got bolded uh, the different service groups that really uh, play into our or participate in um, uh, our license and royalty compliance engagements uh, because uh, these we, we really want to bring a lot of value and a lot of uh, expertise and experience um, uh, into uh, what we're doing here uh, because we've got a lot to offer um, uh, from a from an experience and, and skill set perspective. Uh, in the next slide here, uh, we're just going to break down, and I'll talk more at a high level about our license uh, and royalty compliance uh, division uh, and how we how we approach these engagements. Um, really, we look at these. You know, there's there's really three focus areas from licensing and royalty and franchise, and we're going to break down each one of these uh, in later slides in much more granular detail from really the brains. Uh, on this uh, on this session uh, with Ed and uh, Audrey and, and Doug, uh, so look forward to you learning from them on those. But uh, you know, in the license, in license and licensing and royalty, you know, traditionally we're talking about uh, what we're talking about here is intellectual property and patented intellectual property uh, in the way of you know licensed products or trademarks, brands, you know, methods and operations, how you do things, all those things could potentially be patented, that intellectual property uh, patented and then licensed to uh, licensees. And the licensor obviously gets paid a royalty for the use of that licensed intellectual property. And examples uh, of those, of course, you know, include manufacturing and gaming and entertainment, transportation, technology, biosciences, the, the like. And you, you you, you, can, you can imagine a lot of, uh, of, the, of the different ways that intellectual property can be licensed. Uh, the, the, the third piece there is really uh, franchise. We touch on franchise, uh, franchises and, and those are really driven you know, the, 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 you know, by contracts that, that, um, that get taxes and fees uh, due to a franchise or um, you know, typically the franchisee pays the, you know, pays for trademarks or trade names, brands, processes, and whatnot. Um, and one of the uh, one of the really interesting pieces that will be broken down by Audrey here in a little bit uh, was with regard to government and utilities and and potentially universities and 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 how uh, those franchise fees are paid um, up to the franchisor. Uh, so. Uh, We've got a lot to deliver here, um, so uh, hope you all enjoy it. Go, uh, I'm going to hand this over now to uh, Ed Soriano. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll have my video on in this quick introduction, and then I'll turn it off to uh, so everyone could focus on the content. Uh, so again, uh, I joined iBailey uh, last year, uh, end of June last year, after uh, serving as vice president of GE Ventures for close to four years. And basically, I've been doing intellectual property uh, strategy, commercialization, and successfully uh, delivering uh, royalty revenues uh, to companies that I've worked for, gosh, to close to over 30 years. And, uh, you know, I've uh, delivered this successfully in, in many different industries, uh, starting with at t Bell Labs, uh, did many startups in Silicon Valley, uh, worked for Honeywell Aerospace, uh, did a, a stint with uh, Mars Chocolate, uh, International Game Technology uh, that brought me here to Las Vegas, and uh, lastly, GE Ventures, and then uh, through iBailey, uh, now to help start their licensing, royalty, and compliance service. Uh, a lot of you may ask, you know, Ed, you know, you've been doing this uh, with IP, and these companies are all in different industries, from Bell Labs, uh, Honeywell Aerospace, Mars Chocolate, uh, Regulated Gaming in Vegas, and then GE Ventures. Uh, but the common uh, thing, the common uh, process in all this in delivering revenue, it's the same for all industries. And it's basically the licensing royalty compliance process that we're gonna be explaining today. So whatever industry you're, you're in, it's gonna be the same process to deliver and commercialize revenue. So let's, uh, let's begin with uh, a quick definition of intellectual property, right? So a lot of people, uh, think this IP uh, belongs to patents. No, it's a, it's a, it's a big umbrella uh, that refers to the ownership of any novel idea or design by the person who came up with it. And you protect it by the four major ways that I uh, place bullets on, on the bottom here. So patents are the typical uh, way of protection that most people think that IP uh, you know, what IP is defined. So patents, uh, you know, when you file a patent in different jurisdictions and here in the United States, if you file in the United States Patent and Trademark Office, you are given 20 years protection to exclude others from practicing your invention or design. And that protection uh, gives you the option to definitely exclude others or you can license it out and have others practice that in invention. A uh, good example, I'm gonna provide several examples here is, you know, uh, 22 years ago when high definition uh, television came out, multiple companies held patents uh, on high definition TV. They all came uh, together, cross licensed each other and formed a de facto standard on what high definition TV uh, would be. If they didn't do that, we would have uh, you know, many different televisions out there that uh, had different standards and the broadcasters uh, would have to broadcast in different standards uh, being very expensive and very expensive to roll out a new standard like HDTV. Uh, another good example would be the mobile telephone, uh, cell phone uh, market. Uh, here's some examples of the different strategies that patent holders did. Apple, kept their patents and technology and excluded everyone from practicing that. So Apple has a, a big niche and market. I mean, they, they had a good strategy in rolling out there. They define their market. They define their product on the Apple brand and the, the technology uh, that was behind that brand. And then opposite that, if you don't have an Apple phone, guess what? you're using uh, a mobile phone that's using Google technology. So Google went out there, they, they didn't want to exclude others from using the Android technology. They went out there and said, hey, we're gonna do our, uh, we're gonna make phones using our technology, but you know what? We're gonna open up this technology to everyone. And basically they made a second de facto standard to compete with Apple. And you know what? Uh, Google's making money, not only selling the phones, but guess what? they are getting uh, a piece of the pie of everyone else's mobile phones out there from Sang Samsung, uh, you see out there, or uh, Sony has phones out there. Uh, 
uh, LG has phones out there and so forth. So that, uh, that is a comparison of how two different companies went out there to market. But then there's a third example of how a company went out to market and was not successful in excluding, uh, excluding others. And uh, that would be BlackBerry. So if, you, if you're reading the news lately, BlackBerry just went under and anyone with a BlackBerry phone uh, can no longer use it uh, because they stopped that service. So BlackBerry, you know, in the early 2000s uh, had a huge market share uh, of the, the business, especially the, the business market. And they excluded others from using that technology. Uh, and guess what? They fell behind in competing uh, with features and technology from companies that uh, entered uh, you know, in the early 2000s, like uh, Apple and Google, they, they couldn't keep up and they decided too late to go out to market and open up and license their BlackBerry technology out there. So again, that's a good example of uh, bad strategy and not licensing your technology early enough to compete with new entrants in the market. Trademarks. Uh, so trademarks, uh, if you register your trademark, that will give you protection on that mark just as long as you continue using it. An example of this is GE. So you know, General Electric, where I came from, it's uh, over a 120 year old company uh, that started with the light bulb and did washing machines and so forth. So they built uh, through their heritage through the years, they built uh, a, con a brand that consumers trusted and, and it was well known out there and, and built the, a trusted trademark out there. Uh, but about 25 years ago, they exited the consumer market and focused on uh, four industrial areas, right? It would be power turbines for generators and uh, uh, wind turbines in the renewable uh, industry. And uh, what's, what's well, well known out there is GE engines, right? So if you're flying out there in the plane, you look out the, the window on the, the wing, you probably see a GE engine there. And then the fourth piece is, uh, fourth industry here is if you go to the hospital and need some imaging work, uh, you break a bone or, or something like that, you're going to see a GE uh, MRI machine or imaging machine out there, right? So they're out of the consumer market, but they've had over 100 years uh, with that brand in the consumer market. They exited it. They weren't using that brand. And here comes a company called Hire, a Chinese company. They wanted to enter the U.S. market as well as other markets where GE was well known. And the consumers were not aware of the higher brand. Uh, they were not getting any traction in market. I can tell you right now, they licensed the GE brand. Uh, they approached GE, licensed GE brand, and GE, uh, I can't uh, go with specific numbers, but it, I can tell you it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars in, in royalties that came in by licensing that GE brand to hire. So when you go to Best Buy in the big box markets right now, you're going to see the higher brand that's targeted to the price conscious uh, consumers. And then you're gonna see different levels of the GE brand depending on, uh, on uh, the consumer going from low end to high end. You know, GE would be the next level after higher. You're gonna see uh, GE monogram on the high end. You're gonna see GE cafe on high end appliances and so forth. So again, trademarks, good way to register, protect your trademark and license that trademark out there. Uh, in the areas that you want to. Copyrights uh, is another way to protect your uh, know-how. And basically that provides protection to the author of that, uh, uh, of that work. Uh, and it is, that protection gives, uh, goes for the life of the author plus 70 years. So life of the art, artwork plus 70 years. So copyrights will protect artwork, music, literary works, you know, books and so forth and software. I put software there and I'd like to highlight that, right? So software, uh, a lot of companies out there say, I don't have patents, uh, so there's no IP for me to commercialize. But you know what? Software is very common in every company. I've uh, gone in there to companies in, in banking and finance where they develop software that was specific uh, in, in uh, solving the problems. But guess what? The same problems they had in that uh, banking or finance uh, industry, they can then 
license that software. It's a copyrighted software. They could license it out to other banks to use and uh, they get additional revenue. So uh, it's not only patents out there. Uh, if you're, you have a company out there with proprietary software or, or, or technology, you can license that out. So don't cut yourself short on trying to leverage your IP and gain, getting revenue. And then last of all is trade secrets. So trade secrets will protect your uh, technology or recipe forever. But the big uh, caveat to that is you got to keep it a secret. If uh, you were ever uh, able to end, uh, go to court, you have to prove to a judge that you use your best efforts to uh, keep those recipes or those technologies as a trade secret. So I can tell you right now with Coca-Cola and KFC, they, those recipes are kept in a big safe and uh, only a few people know the full recipe, but a lot of people know different parts of that recipe on that. And they keep it very protected. If you're gonna have access to recipe, you're gonna sign a big non-disclosure agreement uh, in accessing any parts of that recipe. So again, trade secrets, remain trade secrets as long as you make a big effort to keep it a secret. Next slide. So how big is the, the licensing market? Look, uh, it's a $300 billion market. So think about it. There are companies out there uh, worldwide earning $300 billion in licensing revenue. So if you're not leveraging your IP to access or gain additional licensing revenue with little overhead or upfront costs, you're missing out on additional revenue, right? So if you take a look at how big this market is, the 300 billion, uh, you know, a good share of that is an entertainment and character. So you think of like Mickey Mouse and Star Wars out there. There's corporate brands, which I just mentioned with GE, fashion, you know, there's uh, Gucci, Prada and so forth, sports. Think of your you know, favorite uh, football or baseball, basketball team, publishing, of course, books, collegiate, you know, your, your alma mater out there in the uh, favorite college, uh, celebrities. Think of uh, the Jordan brand on shoes. Think of Tiger Woods in golf, right? And then there's artwork and, uh, and uh, nonprofits and so forth. And then on the pants and technology, look, out of the 300 billion, it is almost $50 billion in licensing revenue on patents and technology. And I would include software in this because uh, technology would cover software. And again, if you're not looking at your technology or your patents, you're missing out on, uh, on additional licensing revenue on that. Uh, there are four bullet points out there on, you know, you should think about if you have an existing licensing program, or are thinking of putting together a licensing program. And uh, those four bullet points are, you know, how do you know your licensees are paying your royalties correctly? You know, I've had experience of uh, going in with companies and they have an honor system uh, going on. And I could tell you that honor system is not always an honor system. Uh, then are your agreements properly structured so that you will maximize your license revenues? There are a lot of licensing uh, license agreements out there, but, the, but a lot of licensees will find loopholes or ways around that. So uh, ideally can help you tighten up that language and ensure there is no confusion on what a licensed product is. Do you have a formal license and royalty compliance program based on best practices, right? And, and look, if you're just starting your licensing program or you are growing your licensing program, I barely can help out there. You can outsource uh, some of your uh, needs out to iBailey and we can help you grow your licensing program on that. Uh, next chart. Uh, next. Uh, so as you know, you know I, I just came from GE and, and a lot of people think that you know, a huge uh, you know, $120 billion company like GE uh, with a large licensing group would not need uh, people like I Bailey to come in there and help them out. Uh, false. You know, we brought in I Bailey. Uh, I Bailey uh, you know, uh, has GE as a customer. And, and, you know, even though we had a large licensing program, we 
had a lot of holes in our compliance program, right? In a big company uh, like that with uh, a lot of business, unit, business units, you had a lot of people, uh, let's say, uh, very difficult to follow common process. And, you know, companies like iBailey are needed to come in there, uh, review the process. And, and just like in any process with any company, large or small, uh, there's, there should be always continuous improvement on what is going on there. So uh, whether you're large or small, I barely could go in there, take a look at your process, take a look at what, you know, where the improvements are and how to deliver, again, additional revenue to the company. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll go through uh, different examples of how that's done with different companies. Next chart. Uh, so what does the compliance program look like and how can I daily help you, right? So I can tell you the first thing you have to do is, you know, a lot of companies think that uh, in any compliance program, all they think about is the end uh, result, the audit, you know, which is the end process, right? And they all think that it's going to cost uh, a lot of money to do this audit for each of the license, uh, licensees. But look, if you build a robust compliance program uh, from the very beginning, before you go out there and do the audit, you're going to be able to risk assess your different licensees. You, you, you're going to take a look and uh, put red flags on licensees that are, for example, continuous, continuously late on their royalty payments, or uh, example is the royalty payments are, are flat while the market is growing at 10%. Why aren't the royalties uh, growing at 10%, right? Uh, I'd be able to go in there and, uh, again, plug in a lot of the holes in your uh, and work with your lawyers and plugging a lot of the holes in making your uh, license language and your agreements more concise and more robust. Uh, again, by working with the licensee from the very beginning, you're going to prevent confusion uh, on what different terms of that license agreement is. And by preventing confusion up front, you're going to be getting that money up front versus trying to uncover it on an audit later on and trying to settle for pennies on the dollar. And then once you get to that audit, right? Again, uh, uh, one audit is not the same size for everyone, right? So a lot of people think I got to spend a lot of money on a uh, big forensic audit. If you have your compliance program set up correctly and working with the licensees up front, you're going to be able to de de determine the size of the audit by you know, uh, the size of the company and the, and the revenues coming in. And with the risk assessment, you can determine what type of audit, right? Is it going to be a desktop audit, which would be very minimal in cost, or you could go up the, the line to a light forensic to really, you know, if this company has a lot of red flags uh, on it, you could do that deep forensic audit and you could focus your audit dollars on the licensees that need the audit and not, you know, spend a lot of money in doing the same audit for everyone. Next chart, please. So the audit process, so uh, once you get a good compliance program up and working and working like an oil machine, it's going to be a self-sustaining process. I give an example of IGT, International Game, uh, International Game Technology, which is the biggest and largest uh, slot machine manufacturer in the regulated gaming world. Uh, I can tell you when I came in there, uh, I spent eight years with IGT, and when I started uh, with IGT, yeah, they had they had no compliance program, and a lot of the audits were very confrontational on this. So what you have to do is put that compliance program uh, together, tweak your language uh, in all your new agreements, and take a proactive approach versus a reactive uh, process or approach to your licensees. Uh, I can tell you within those eight years, I turned. Uh, with a compliance program and a good audit program, we went from a confrontational approach with licensees to having a trusted business relationship where they, they expected this audit every year, that it was a business process uh, that was uh, trusted and that there was trust in uh, seeing the auditors come in and seeing the same faces every year instead of different faces every year, right? In uh, working with the auditors as well as the licensor, uh, they knew what records were going to be looked at. So every year after the first audit, 
things were easy. Instead of spending eight hours on an audit, it was a one hour audit. So the cost of doing the audit went down, right? And then with the right language on, an, uh, on a license agreement, typically if over 3% of underpayments are uncovered, the licensee pays for the audit. So again, that language in, uh, will incent the licensee to comply with the license and to reach out to the auditors as well as the licensor to ensure that they are following the agreement correctly. And, and as you can see here, uh, when I started with IGT, 75 to 85% of the licensees that we looked at had errors in their royalty reporting. And during those eight years with uh, IGT, my licensing group of four people brought in over $500 million in royalty revenues to IGT. That, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars we brought in every year, not only covered the four people, right, in my group, but gosh, we became the most profitable but smallest profit center with, within IGT. The revenue we brought in was basically straight revenue because the only cost to that revenue was the overhead, uh, the four headcount on that revenue, right? Again, proactive versus reactive, getting uh, a good compliance program out there will bring in additional revenues. If you have an existing licensing program, I could assure you additional revenues will be uncovered and you will be getting that revenue upfront then trying to settle uh, big settlements uh, at the end on pennies and dollar. Uh, good. One last example on this is uh, when I started with IGT, we uncovered $40 million in underpayments, uh, in, in, in royalty payments for one company. That company could not afford $40 million to take a hit on their financials. I mean, the board of directors uh, basically fell off their uh, seats when they heard that uh, they owed $40 million to IGT. Uh, I can tell you right now, we had to go to mediation and court to get that settled. At the end of the day, instead of getting $40 million, IGT got $8 million. So you don't want to put yourself in that predicament. Get a, a proactive approach with a good compliance program upfront and work with your licensee uh, and treat the licensee licensor relationship as a, as a trusted business relationship. Again, maximizing licensing revenue to your company and shareholders. Next chart. Okay, and uh, this will be a handoff to Audrey, uh, great colleague and uh, know-how in uh, our licensing and uh, trademark audits. Audrey? Thank you, Ed, and hi, everyone. Um, and welcome back to those who've attended before. Um, I want to introduce myself as it feels like I've been introduced before, but um, I have been with the firm now four years. As um, Eric Pulse mentioned, I am a senior manager within our risk advisory services, and I help to lead our internal audit practice, our royalty licensing and franchise audits, as well as performance audits for local and state municipalities. And I will go ahead and move us through the um, license, trademark, royalty, franchise, audits, which really starts with a compliance program. And what we're seeing here is the, the really the starting of any really good audit is you want objectives. What is the end point that you're looking for with any engagement? Um, and for this one, um, I'm just presenting with you the primary objectives that we look for with really any licensing royalty or franchise audit. First, what we like to start with is getting to know you. And I'm not really talking about being stranded on a desert island getting to know you, but rather getting to know what you know and what you don't know about your agreements. And it's surprising how much we really don't know about agreements with the individuals we work with and understanding the history of why the agreement was created as well as the various relationships, the players that are involved um, it's really in the review of the agreement that I find that we start to really understand the players and the actors and how various interpretations of the contract language can be misinterpreted, such as net sales or who pays the patent expenses. So we really get into that level of, of detail and 
basically we figure out all the licensees payment history or lack thereof um, primarily lack thereof because that's really uh, what the impetus of somebody reaches out to Ide Bailey and says hey we need your help we have not had um, our license licensees or sub licensees paying our royalties or um, franchisees not paying their their franchise tax or um, revenue so that's typically where we come in as lack of lack of payment but their position on really what is owed and the primary reason for their position needs to be understood as to why payment is not being made. Um, the last bullet is really um, to find out about the accounting methods, processes, and systems that the licensee is utilizing. And that's really a lot like pulling teeth in this process. And like most good dentists, or in this case, auditors, um, we, we actually are able to be successful in getting this information from the licensees or the franchisees and helping to figure out um, what the information was supposed to be provided to our customers. So I hope I didn't just jinx that, but we have had a really good track record. All right, next slide. All right, so the last slide really focused a bit on what our audit objectives are and really what we seek to bring to light. I want to shift the gears here and share with you the benefits or why a compliance program is important. And um, Ed Soriano did such a great job of demonstrating the, the vast areas in which the um, franchisees and licensees and patents and intellectual property are all really important. And I always learn something new whenever I listen to Ed and I really like the artwork that was added and I hadn't heard that before. But first, let me reiterate that a compliance program is really the means and methods for tracking and monitoring of agreements and really the various aspects that it takes to proactively ensure timely and complete payments from royalty, license, and franchise agreements. These benefits are based on an effective compliance program, and I really emphasize effective because there's a lot of compliance programs out there, but really for them to work and really get to the proactive approach, um, it needs to be effective, which in some cases it needs to be created from scratch it may need to be modified or a full scrap and rebuild of an ineffective compliance program. So first off, and probably the most important that our clients have told us is that by having us on board to create and enforce a compliance program, their licensees become more responsive. This is because we know that they, or we know, but they know as well that they're being monitored or watched by quote, big brother. They express that there is an increase in, they meaning our customers express that they um, receive an increase in timely and accurate payments, including missed or inaccurate payments being trued up. And ultimately really that's the main objective that was mentioned on the other slide is to recoup that money, um, ensure that proper payments complete and accurate are there going forward. Um, and that's really what we're striving for. So that revenue is paid upfront and accurately rather than negotiating a smaller settlement at the end of an audit. Additionally, we have seen not just better relationships, but the creation of relationships where they had not existed before a program or process was put into place. In reality, our audits have been the first time in a while, even years, that the person owing money, aka the licensee or sub-licensee or franchise audit, actually starts communicating with our customer. Lastly, having a compliance program that is enforced minimizes or reduces the risk. And we'll talk about risk in the next slide, but the risk of inaccurate, incomplete, or just flat out non-payment. So now that you know the importance of a compliance program or the benefits, we will continue to go into a bit more detail and focus on the risks that a compliance program addresses and that are included in our audit approach such as the risk that I just mentioned, the risk of inaccurate, incomplete, or just flat out non-payment. Listed here and importantly highlighted here are the risks that are mitigated with a formal compliance program in place. Our intent is really to make this process bomb-proof 
and avoid the more common hiccups such as the human error element, which is really baked into most of these, if not all of these bullets on the slide. And what I'm showing here is just an overview of what we focus on when we are evaluating, designing, or creating a compliance program. And one thing to note is that this is not a canned approach or a one size fits all. Rather, it's a tailored process that's designed for each compliance program that feeds into the audit process. And I'll just take a minute to point out a few of these, such as the risk that sales or transfers to related parties don't reflect the full price to the customer or arm's length price. Or how about the risk of unintentional misinterpretation of license agreements, or even just the flip of that? Instead of unintentional, what about intentional misinterpretations of license agreements? And one that we see a lot is missing or incomplete non-capture of required documentation to support royalty reports and comply with the license agreement. These risks and many more are baked into our risk assessment process, which I'll get into next. As part of the compliance approach, as mentioned, we perform a risk assessment to help inform the decision about which license agreement or agreements or which licensee or licensees to audit. You know, we're looking at the really big picture, the full population, and at which point our customers are also comparing that to their budget and saying, where should we spend and put our resources in which area to get the best return on investment? So this approach helps to actually make that targeted effort on behalf of our customers. And what Ed Soriano had mentioned earlier when it comes to risk assessment, our approach is really to identify which audits would require a desktop audit, which is just a basic review, a light forensic or a deep forensic audit, or what auditors like to categorize as low, medium, or high risk. So typically, um, and I think you guys all know this, is that the best return on your investment is really to focus in on those high risk to medium risk licensees or franchisees, um, or also what we call our problem child or children or um, we really just decide we're going to do a full-blown assessment of the entire population of the licensees and we start to give them attributes or factors that we take into consideration when rating each licensee and potentially each agreement. So basically said another way, we can look at the entire population, there's also low-hanging fruit that we've gone after and then done a risk assessment with the rest of the licensees and in, in agreements. Um, but primarily, um, low-hanging fruit is the, probably the quickest return on investment. Um, get a little bit of the revenue um, back that you hadn't received or hadn't been receiving um, and start moving into the other licensees and agreements. So listed here are some of the sources of information that we look at to obtain and build our understanding of the associated risk. And this is really through discussions, research, and requests from information from all the various departments like legal, compliance, and accounting. So we'll determine where to focus our time and attention and whether that is in unreported or underreported licensed products, deficient reporting practices, or reporting that's not in alignment with the growth and the trend of the industry. It could also be a major accounting system change at the licensee's organization, which is often seen reflected in a new or different royalty reporting format. Or maybe there was a triggering event that occurred but went unreported. So when the risk assessment is completed and we have honed in on the license agreement or agreements and the licensee or licensees to audit and the audit type of, I'm sorry, low, medium or high risk type of audit that we will conduct, we get into our testing procedures to ensure that the licensee is compliant with all financial and economic terms. The licensee is less likely to underreport royalties if a risk of audit exists. So right off the bat, we are, we, we get a lot of um, compliance with our licensees that we reach out on behalf of our clients or customers um, because of that. And I'll talk about it later, the audit clause within um, those agreements. But in performing the audit, um, our dedicated group, um, my, the team that I work with and, and have really fostered a, a good working relationship over, gosh, seems like forever, <laughs> 17 plus years. Um, 
really just want to quickly move into some of the testing procedures that we we do the testing of the licensees and, and I'm just reading off of the highlights here but testing licensees books and records for agreement with royalty reports what we do here is ensure that the licensee is calculating reporting and paying royalties completely and accurately we will reconcile units and royalty reports to inventory roll forward and another, another testing procedure is to trace a selection of units by order, customer, period, depending on reporting detail, to customer invoices and our shipping documents. Same as the inventory, we will compare orders to invoices or shipping documents to identify missing transactions that should be reported and included in the royalty payments. Next slide, please. So this is the high level process flow of what we just talked about um, and it really picks up after the compliance program walks through the risk assessment identifying the individual targets the franchisees licensees we address the budget and the audit approach how um, far we can get into the engagement is it a light medium or um, high risk we develop the audit approaches and that's really a collaborative effort where the audit team develops the pertinent details of the audit approach and works with the necessary individuals involved. We execute the audit and then we review the results and formulate next steps. One interesting next step, if it's not, you know, we're done with the audit, the um, individual is now um, complying with the terms and the conditions of the agreement, back on track with their payments, they've trued up all their past payments, one is um, we sometimes have to escalate a, say, a low risk audit into a high risk audit. And in that case, um, we've had to do that a couple of times, but um, we'll get into some examples in just a minute. Next slide, please. All right, so this, sorry, I'm talking fast. I can see that we're running out of time. This takes us into our customer examples and I'll go ahead let you know that I'll turn this over to Ed and then I will give a couple of examples and then we'll turn it over to Doug Slyke and um, we'll have Matt and myself wrap up before you guys end for the day. Hello everyone, this is Ed again. So some quick examples here uh, uh, before I hand it, hand it back over to Audrey and Doug. So existing companies today uh, that I'm encountering are, are looking for us to, gosh, uh, review their patents to see if there's any commercial viability on that. Uh, two, I've seen examples of companies that say they have no patents, but guess what? Their trademarks and their proprietary process can still be licensed out, and they didn't think that they had that avenue uh, out there because they thought their patents expired. Three, uh, quickly, is I had a company here with a proprietary uh, protein bar recipe, and they said, well, look, uh, we're not willing to license it out. This is our core market, and there is no licensing opportunity here. But guess what? What I ceded uh, to them is, well, have you thought of taking that uh, protein recipe and going to adjacent markets where you're not in? Uh, taking that protein recipe into health powders, right? Or uh, health drinks and so forth. So again, we could see uh, to our customers on other avenues that they never thought of on that. So Audrey, why don't you uh, take, uh, uh, take them, take our uh, folks here to your example. Thank you, Ed. So I want to share with you a recent franchise fee and tax audit that we performed for a local municipality. This um, municipality was focused on franchise fee and tax from utilities and wanted to know why their telecommunications franchise fees were trending significantly no lower each year. And additionally, we wanted to determine whether the fees received from all the other utilities, such as power, gas, water, and cable providers um, were complete and accurate for all the utilities within the municipal right away. So to start with, the customer requested a full sweep and review of their existing contracts and to perform a gap analysis. And right away, that was a red flag to me. I'm like, what do you mean? You're missing, you don't know if you don't have contracts with certain franchisees. Well, come to find out that there was 10 contracts that were missing and revenue that was not being collected by these franchisees. Additionally, with the contracts, we notified our customer that we would be enacting the right to audit clause, which typically states and includes not only do we have the right to audit, but um, if the audit shows that a franchise fee payment has been underpaid by 5% or more, the franchisee pays the total cost not to exceed a certain amount 
for each year of the audit period, and that's the look back period. And sometimes that look back is three to five years, so you do the math. Um, lastly, they needed us to create a compliance program for them, and that was one that needed to be proactive rather than reactive, which is what they currently had, and also include getting the legal department involved, which they did not have, and, and they also did not have their contracts group involved, probably why they had those missing 10 contracts. Next slide, please. So what we found was not only the the uh, missing contracts, but they also had expired contracts going back as far as 10 years. So the right to audit clause was not essentially effective or in force and the look back period um, for the, the audit clause, the reimbursement. Um, in this case, we examined the state's database, which is called a ZIP plus four database. So it's a five digit ZIP code plus four digit extension. And this is for the telecommunication taxes. We took the state's database and we compared that information with the municipality's residential addresses and identified several thousand addresses that were not being picked up by the telecommunication services. We could verify that these addresses were receiving telecommunication services, but the revenue was not flowing through to the state's database. So in this case, when we helped the entity, the municipality, true up and retroactively true up their franchise tax that was owed, um, in addition to the missing franchise agreements, basically they recouped enough money to pay for our audit 10 times over, hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right, so this one is an example of a recent university engagement that we conducted. And this one, the, goodness, um, looking at the completeness and accuracy of their royalty revenue, um, they had multiple licensees and these licensees sub-licensed the technology, the intellectual property to other sub-licensees. And in the course of this, audit this engagement, this was one of the high risk engagements that was started out at a low level desk audit and graduated to that high risk based on the licensee and sub licensee relationship. We were recognizing that the payments were not being made and so we were able to help them recover um, known payments that had not been paid for several years as well as to help them get those royalty reporting documents in agreement with the the contract, and then we were also able to help them identify all the sub licensees and the royalty payments that they were unaware of. And this was close to 250,000 plus all the patent expenses and all the sub licensee onboarding um, fees that they were supposed to receive 20K for each sub licensee that we helped to recover. I'll now quickly turn it over to Doug, who will walk us through another example. Good morning. I'm a manager within the risk advisory services in Denver and I'm going to overview a recent project related to a public sector client with revenues in excess of $120 billion annually. We performed a deep forensic high risk review of the license agreement that was initiated in Q4 of 2018. So we reviewed the following 13 quarters of reported royalty payments. And this, this audit was requested by the licensor as the licensee had approximately 50 sub licensees. So the, the process which we performed this was, we performed our risk assessment, which entailed inaccuracy of royalty reporting, understatement of revenue, overstatement of allowable expenses, which were deductions, misinterpretations of the contract, inappropriate or non-contractual deductions, inadequacy of the financial inputs, that would be the level of detail or support that accompanied that quarterly reporting, and the untimeliness of reporting. So the procedures that we performed were we performed an in-depth analysis of all contracts, 
that between the licensor and licensee and the licensee and sub licensees. And to provide the scale of that, there's this was approximately $30 million of revenue from the sub licensees. The other area of emphasis was we reviewed the cost, the deductions, approximately $13 million of legal expenses to maintain and defend those intellectual property rights. We facilitated the discussions between the licensor and licensee through entering a non-disclosure agreement. And that allowed us to review all financial inputs for that royalty reporting, specifically the detail of the $13 million of legal expenses. The results were, we identified the contractual terms weren't clearly stated and did lead to misinterpretation. We recalculated the amount due at the conclusion of that contract, Q4 2021. And that amount was recalculated at 1.3 million versus $31,000 reported by the licensee. So 4,300% increase. We led discussions between the, the two parties to um, identify where the, uh, the contract had the um, areas of misinterpretation. And then we provided, we worked with the licensor who requested the audit and provided detailed recommendations on how to overhaul their licensee reporting process from the contract inception through remitting payments to implement both better controls on processes. And the, um, the project ultimately led to restoring the relationship between the two parties and them avoiding litigation. I will pass it back on to my colleagues. So thank you. So uh, um, obviously we're out of time here, but in assessing your situation, I just wanna make a very brief comment. As you see, this goes from light gray to dark. And one of the things I'm sure on everyone's mind is, hey, how can I dip my toe in the water? The thing for me is where Ed is so special, he could come in very quickly and a very minimal cost. And he could look at your um, IP portfolio and see what your go-to-market strategies are and what you could take on and very quickly in a very minimal cost, get you involved to gain a better understanding of our overall program. And then obviously then we could explain the rest of this, uh, including the audits, the post-contract and the full data warehouse solution. So um, really look forward to hopefully having an, um, a, a small and short conversation with each of you to understand things and how we can add a little bit more value.